So welcome back, Dr. Magarelli. My pleasure, Michelle. It's a beautiful day. How are you? Good, good. Um, so we're going to continue where we were last time, where we ended. Um, okay. So I wanted to ask you about ERA, endometrial sure. receptivity analysis. Yes, well, it's um, it started originally as ERA stood for endometrial receptivity assay. Mm -hmm. assay. And uh, there was only one company, it was iGenomics. And what the hypothesis was, was that, um, and we had been studying animal models and other models, was there are a set of genes that must be turned on exactly during the implantation window. And uh, iGenomics looked at about 212 of them. And what they were able to calculate was given a standard dose of progesterone, because that's the only thing that matters. Your estrogen, you know, you have to have a certain lining, but then, you're, then once you have a certain lining, which is seven millimeters trilamina for an embryo transfer, you, you typically have to give a certain amount of days. And if you mimic nature, you know, 12 plus six is, you know, is, uh, is 18. So day 17 and 18 are your implantation windows up to day 19. So from 17 to 19, so giving, given six days of progesterone, which was the standard and made sense based on our biology, what genes get turned on in those cycles where there's pregnancy and what genes don't, mm -hmm. you know? So they studied those genes and they found that they could actually predict pretty well in about 25% of cases um, what uh, genes uh, were not turned on, which caused the patient not to get pregnant. And then we're able to calculate how many days, either more or less, you would need to get all those genes turned on. Mm -hmm. And so that's what was called the implantation window. So what they do is they report a number. It's either, uh, you know, the, it's either not long enough for pre-receptive, receptive, or post-receptive. So... Mm -hmm. That was how it started. And then uh, Cooper Genomics, which is another genetics company, they came out with another one. And part of my problem with any uh, test is if only one company does the test, you gotta be suspect. So a second company came out, and by the way, there were lots of publications associated with it. And so they came out with the ER peak. So you had the ERA, now the ER peak. So now you can just say, you know, the ER, the endometrial receptivity analysis, because it's not really you know, assay, and it's not really peak. So the ERA, right? <laughs> call it the ERA. Right? It's like calling tissue paper a Kleenex, right? You know, like, that a Kirk or Q-tip, <laughs> exactly, yeah, exactly. You know, or Charmin's or something. So that's what it's that's what it's for. Now, who uses it? This is the key. Now, it um, it's about a thousand bucks. Mm -hmm. So, and as you know, in my practice at CMY Fertility and before at uh, Magarelli Fertility Centers, our goal was to make sure that whatever treatments we're doing are cost-effective and efficacious. And we don't want it too, too many add-ons if they really don't help. And in, honestly, in only about 25% of cases are the reason why people don't get pregnant is because their window is not in, they're not in sync. Mm -hmm. So it really only helps, you know, one in four couples. Mm -hmm. Now, who do I use it on initially? I don't offer it to everyone. I mean, it's on our website, but it, I don't offer it to everyone. But if you have had a chromosomally normal embryo transferred and you don't get pregnant, before you put in another chromosomally normal embryo, I strongly feel that those couples, and in those couples, 75% of those couples will be helped. Got so it. You, 75% of 25, right? You, you, you kind of got that. So those are the folks I would offer it to. Mm -hmm. Anyone can have it, and it, maybe everyone should have it, but since it's, a, you know, if it, was, if it was 50 bucks, 100 bucks a test, right. or 200 bucks a test, but 1,000 bucks, that could mean, in our program, that could mean you don't do a, a frozen embryo transfer because you can't afford it. So mm -hmm. you have to balance that. So if your patients are having implantation failures, even without chromosomally tested embryos. If you work them up for implantation failures and they're not implanting and you can't, you're scratching your head, even though they're not chromosomally uh, tested, 
in a young woman under 35, if you've done that two or three times and they're still not getting pregnant and you've checked everything else, like the uterus out, hormones out, you know, alcohol, tobacco is not being used, those kind of things, then you might want to suggest the endometrial receptivity assay. So the main reason why is to see the exact timing, um, time window that would be ideal. Um, and in so doing, is it also like an endometrial scratching? Well, you know, you, what? you need to do that. Yeah, because in a sense, now I'll talk about endometrial scratching in just a second, but your answer, my answer to you is that is exactly right because you are biopsying or scraping. So what I should tell you how scraping. to do the ERA. Yeah. yeah. The way you do an mm -hmm. ERA test is you give the patients exactly what you would do for an embryo transfer, typically frozen embryo transfer. Not this isn't this doesn't apply to fresh embryo transfers, just so you know. This is mm -hmm. only frozen. Got it. Um you, so you typically do the whole cycle as if you're going to do a transfer, but instead of putting an embryo in, you take a sample out, you scratch or take a biopsy of the lining. So yes, you sort of get, you hit two birds with one stone in that, in that case. Right. And then just so people know, like if they've never heard of it, um, why would the endometrial scraping benefit people? It does not. Oh, doesn't? You don't think so? No, I do not believe in thinking. I believe in data. Oh, yes. Sorry. And, <laughs> I should know this. <laughs> I'm not a thinker. Yeah, I'm yeah. A data, I'm, as my best friend says, you're a data doo-doo doctor. Yes. Data doo -doo doctor. <laughs> uh, that, uh, I can't help it. I'm not going to change at 100 years old. I'm not changing. But um, Cochrane, which is one of the Canadian, it's a, it's a, a scientific organization that takes and does meta-analyses. Mm -hmm. And there are now been huge meta-analyses and individual papers which show no benefit whatsoever. And mm. so I'm not a guy who doesn't, when I see, I, if I'm in a situation where the data is controversial, sure, I'll try it. And I have. Right. But if there's definitive, good, strong, non-controversial non, um, data and you can look up the Cochrane team, C O C H R A N E Cochrane, mm -hmm. and um, it irrefutably says, looking at all the studies, putting all the studies together, it doesn't do a hill of beans. Mm -hmm. So again, that's a that's a procedure. People still do it, and I'm not mm -hmm. against people doing it if they want to do it because I'm not sure it does any harm. Right, but. I'm a kind of a simple guy, you know, mm -hmm. if it works, I do it. If it's controversial, I might do it. But if, if it says it's not really helping, our poor patients have enough things thrown at them. True. They, they don't need another thing unless you're pretty darn sure. And this is, again, my personal approach to medicine. Unless you're pretty darn sure that it's going to help the patient, I just, I just don't have that. I don't believe it's the right thing to do. Well, that's great information for people listening because I didn't even know that. I didn't know that. Um, I haven't heard that it was because you'd think that if it's offered, there's a reason for it or it's worth it. <laughs> well, but yeah. So um, every, and I, I love pulling your leg as an acupuncturist, but you're probably doing lots of stuff that worked 3000 years ago that you have no idea is benefiting anybody, but you assume it. <laughs> So I was joking about the Chinese medicine. You know, the herbs may have worked in, uh, you know, primeval China, but you have no idea in today. You don't even know if the herbs are the same herbs in a sense, right? Mm -hmm. How they're cultured. So it's just part of medicine, you know, yeah. and people want to do it. I'm not against them doing it. And there are people in our practice who strongly believe it's the right thing to do, but you're talking to me. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you're talking to me. Talking you're talking yeah. to me right. Yeah. Okay. Talking to you. Right. and yeah. you're italian <laughs> exactly. um so okay i mean this is really good information i'm really glad we're talking about this because i'm sure there's a lot of people going through the ivf practice uh, process and not knowing that the studies don't really show any benefit to the scraping so right it's and valuable gonna medicine it's gonna it ebbs and flows and i want to yeah. make sure no definitive yes or no when it comes to reproduction. We are not allowed to do repro uh, 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 research on pregnant women. Mm -hmm. We're not allowed to do research on embryos. We're not allowed right. to do an embryo implantation. We can only infer things. Mm -hmm. And if you 
can only infer, then you're going to you're going to have controversy and you're going to have confusion. And I try to tell my patients that, guys, we don't have a definitive answer. We're, tr we're willing to try yeah. things. And we're a practice that really is at the forefront of, yes, we're willing to try it and give you the benefit of the doubt. Um, there are many people who have very strict rules, and I don't think that's fair because the data are not that strong. They're right. good, not that, they're not perfect by any stretch. Yeah. And then last time you talked about fresh transfers coming back, yeah, um, which yeah. I found interesting because most yeah. of the people that I treat are doing frozen. So, yes. and then you had spoken about how it really depends on the person, like who would benefit yeah. from a fresh transfer and who would benefit from a frozen embryo transfer? Absolutely. Is that a question for it's me? It's a question. Yeah, it's a question for you. <laughs> okay. okay. I wasn't sure you, yeah, it was a good segue. Yeah. Um, so here's what I think. Um, if we look at the human uterus, right? It's, if you, whatever the estimates are, 5 million, 10 million, it's 10 million years of evolution. Mm -hmm. The uterus, the hormones, the how humans reproduce is about 10 million years of experience. And if we look at uh, in vitro fertilization, we're at 40 years of experience. And really, only about the last 15 have had monumental under better understanding of, of how incubators work and blastocyst culture and vitrification, freezing of the embryo. So we have lots of newness to what we do. So. If you have a patient who has an embryo, well, let's say she has an embryo and uh, she doesn't have PCOS and didn't hyperstimulate, where's the best place for it? Is it to freeze it and then do another cycle, especially mm -hmm. if your progesterone is less than 1.5 and your estrogen is less than 3,000? Maybe the answer is let that beautiful uterus pick it out. Now you have a patient who has PCOS, she hyperstims, her lining is super lush, meaning it's overgrown because she's produced so much estrogen mm -hmm. and that estrogen has now ruined the, the lining. So if you freeze the embryos, let the lining slough and then plan with the right amount of estrogen and progesterone the next month's transfer, then you see significant improvements in pregnancy rates. And that wow. was the root done by Dr. Shapiro out of Nevada was that's where he hit it out of the park. So then everybody inferred that if we do frozen embryo transfers, you'll have a better outcome. Right. So, and all of a sudden you took one little piece, PCOS patients, hyperstimulation patients benefited. And now we said, okay, everybody's gonna benefit. So it's like a blanket statement, yeah. yeah. Well- Or we assumption. Like, <laughs> yeah, and, and we like to, we like to, um, we like to have things set in little boxes because it makes our decision making easier. Mm -hmm. So um, I did that. As soon as it happened, I put everybody how to do frozen embryo transfers, mm -hmm. everybody. And I looked at my data, right? And I saw what I thought I saw was about a 15% improvement mm -hmm. if I did that. And that's what the literature said. Mm -hmm. But what I didn't do was the correct denominator how many people did not get a transfer because the embryos didn't survive the thaw? Oh, mm -hmm. now all of a sudden that changes the whole way you look at the data. You're not right. looking at yeah. transfer. You have to look at per egg retrieval. How many people got pregnant per egg retrieval mm -hmm. per embryo transfer? Mm -hmm. And that takes a lot of thinking. And then once you get right. it, you go, of course, that makes sense. So when you look at pregnancy rates per egg retrieval in the United States, the past five years, 10 years, we've gone down 15%. Wow. It well, is scary. That's a lot. With a, yes. Wow. And, and that's essentially due to frozen embryo transfers and pre-implantation genetic testing. Because I was 85% PGTA, freeze all. And because I was getting 60, 70% pregnancy rates, I was like, woo, woo, I'm so good. Look at me, ha ha, <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And, um, but if you actually look at it per egg retrieval, because you lose in the biopsy, you lose in blastocyst culture, you lose in vitrification, you lose in the thaw, 
um, and you could actually lose them simply in the process of freezing by literally losing an embryo because they're microscopic, right? Mm -hmm. You're dipping them in liquid nitrogen. That's the method. <laughs> they could disappear, you know? Um, so you got to watch your denominator. That's my biggest issue with all medicine. Mm -hmm. A lot of studies hide the truth. And, and by the way, acupuncture is no different. When I hear people say, oh, 80% of my patients get pregnant with acupuncture. Well, how many percent don't? <laughs> mm -hmm. right. I mean, nobody tracks them. Yeah. You know? Nobody tracks them uh, yeah. unless, they're not, unless they're Dr. Kardem, right? Because she'll. It's do almost them. like you need to know how to track. I think that that's really the key. Is just that uh, yeah. we think we know how to measure the data, but it is a very specific science. And so, what I would say is, um, if a patient has numerous, numerous, well, let's talk about it three different ways, because I keep getting this question every time uh, on lives and everything else. Is, you do 11 days of stimulation, and the reason you're doing 11 days of stimulation, or 10 or 10 or 12, it doesn't matter, is to grow eggs that normally would die. So the first thing you're doing is allowing eggs that are there. You're not making eggs grow. You're making eggs that could grow, grow. So every month, a 1,000 eggs could grow, but in nature, only one egg, our bodies only produce enough hormone for one egg to grow. We throw away 999. Mm -hmm. So in IVF, we give the food, follicle stimulating hormone, the brain hormone, at high doses to make things grow. So the first thing, benefit of IVF is we're getting eggs that would normally die to grow. So we're never taking one extra egg. We're only taking the eggs that could grow and helping them grow. That's it. So that's a key concept. So we're never going to go through menopause early if we do 100 IVF cycles. You're just going to, you're going to go through menopause, whatever your chromosomes say. Then we get the eggs. And so what people don't realize is let's use 20 year old because they're the ideal candidate. 70% of eggs are at, well, 50 to 70 in the, in, in, let's use 50 because it sounds horrible. Let's use 50%. 50% of eggs in the 20 year old cohort are abnormal. The eggs are abnormal. Just because you can grow them doesn't mean that those are normal eggs. Mm -hmm. So now you have 10, what look like you eggs, we know that five of them shouldn't even fertilize. So then you fertilize them. If you do traditional IVF, no ICSI, the best we hope for is 50% of those to fertilize. So when people say to me, why are you doing 100% ICSI when I have normal sperm? Embryos. If I get 50% with normal IVF, just simply putting the egg together with 25,000 sperm and hope they mm -hmm. fertilize, Versus if I take a sperm and I put it inside the egg, which is ICSI, mm -hmm. I get 70% to fertilize. So that means I get 20% more embryos. The mm -hmm. game is more eggs, more embryos, more babies. So now I have embryos. But 50% of those embryos that are made are chromosomally abnormal. Mm -hmm. When they're combined together, 50% of those are chromosomally abnormal. Mm -hmm. So now those have to grow. Now, Traditionally, we grow them, we used to grow them to day three, and our pregnancy rates, and people don't believe this, was 15%. And we were on the, the, the cover of Time magazine. Mm -hmm. That was insane. That was amazing. And so we've evolved. And when the evolution was, well, what if each day we grow them, nature will figure out which ones are normal, which ones are not? Let nature decide. If right. they don't grow, not normal. If they do grow, they're normal. And that was the assumption was that we had a perfect embryo culture. Mm -hmm. Remember, the assumption there is we have a perfect embryo culture. Of course we don't. Our bodies are a perfect culture, mm -hmm. but right. the laboratory is an estimate of a good culture limited to three. There's like three culture mediums. That mm -hmm. doesn't say a lot about nature. So now we let it grow. So let's say you're 40 years old and you get three beautiful embryos on day three. Oh, hell, put them in your body. Right. There's no benefit to growing them to day five in that circumstance. Mm -hmm. But let's say you're 20 years old and you have 15 beautiful embryos on day three. Well, hell, you might as well let them grow because you'll have eight much more likely normal embryos on day five. Right, right. So that's, how you, that's how you have a conversation with your patients 
so they understand the process. So there's no one way fits all. As a matter right. of fact, as a matter of fact, there are patients who don't get pregnant with day five culture and do get pregnant with day three. Mm -hmm. Again, that doesn't surprise me because we do not have a perfect culture system. Mm -hmm. And for whatever reason, there may be factors that we're going to find out in five years, 10 years, 15 years inside the uterus. We know nothing about right. growth hormone, intrauterine growth factors. Who knows? And then all of a sudden we say, oh, we should have been doing this all, all along. Right. You know, adding you know, this to our. It's interesting right. that you're saying that because I did have one patient. She was a little older and. Um, her doctor suggested to freeze, I believe it was day three, like earlier. Um, that's was that, so that's, that's one. So yeah. When, when we're talking about pregnancy. So then the other question is, is when do you freeze? What's the best time to freeze? To be frank with you, the very best time to freeze, and I'll give you the reason, uh, is day five, six, or seven. Mm -hmm. Glasses. Why? Because 98 to 99% of them survive the freezing process. Mm -hmm. However, they very many times women don't make it to day five with their embryos, especially mm -hmm. if they're older, as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Well, in that case, it's kind of a bummer if you run a race and two feet before the finish line, they, they throw away the finish line, right? Mm -hmm. The finish line transfer. So one is psychological, they wanna get a transfer, so let them freeze on day three. The other thing about freezing on day three, we only expect 50% to survive the fall. Mm -hmm. Now, that may not be true anymore because that's old data. I haven't looked at this in a long, long, long time. But the blastocyst freezing process, vitrification, has the best yield. Mm -hmm. So that might be a reason why you go to day five. But if you only have two or three embryos, put them in. Don't do yeah. See, that's the, your patient is stuck because... This doctor may believe that they can only that frozen embryo transfers are better. Your your patients. Um, so what happens is that people are encouraged by by their doctors to do what's best for them. And by the way, their doctors are their doctors, so therefore that is best best for them. Mm -hmm. But if they're looking for alternatives or other opinions, there are many ways to skin a cat. There's many yeah. ways to. Even acupuncturists, you know, some believe in electroacupuncturists, electro stem, some laser, some, mm -hmm. you know, and I'm not sure right. there's a right or wrong. I just yeah. not sure. Without a doubt. And actually, it's interesting you were talking about the culture. Um, I've heard of endometrial co culture, follicular fluid co culture, and I wanted to get your not thoughts, sure. but knowing on that. <laughs> okay, well, my knowledge <laughs> about that is. <laughs> Okay, no, and the funny thing is, that's one area where um, I did a lot of work with Klaus Wiemer, uh, who is one of the preeminent embryologists in our field. Uh, his whole world was surrounded on, on co-culture with follicular cell, uh, um, fallopian tube cells, co-culture. Mm -hmm. So it's not done. I mean, the problem is it's not done routinely, and most of us don't use co-culture. It's a complex procedure. You have to get to certain types of cells. There's lots of, of um, logistical things that play a role in, in, um, in, 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 in what they're trying to do. Let me, let, um, let me back up a second. What is the purpose of it? The purpose of it is for the very reason I mentioned before, there are many factors that we simply don't know contribute to a egg and an embryo's development. So, mm -hmm. since the fertilized fertilization of human eggs occurs in the fallopian tube, and the fallopian tube uh, carries about the first three to five days of development of the embryo, mm -hmm. Dr. Gardner, who developed blastocyst culture, mm -hmm. studied exactly what was going on in the fallopian tube and designed the media because it turns out that every, I'll say, inch of the six inches of the fallopian tube, there's a different composition of the fluid that's in there. So the evolution of humans was to create a laboratory in the fallopian tubes that would adjust as the embryo grew. 
Mm-hmm. So there's so so what what is doing it? Well, it's the lining of the endothelium endothelial cells of the fallopian tube that are manufacturing these factors. Mm. So they thought, what if we layer the bottom of our petri dishes, in that case petri dishes, with this layer of cells and let the embryo grow on it? Maybe the it'll grow better. Well, we advanced so quickly with the culture system for blastocyst culture. Mm-hmm. And we went from 15% to 60% pregnancy rates. Mm-hmm. It's People don't tend to, to get 61% pregnancy rate mm-hmm. is probably not the eff- worth the effort, except right. for that 1% person, that 1% person where that's a matter of life or death, right? Yeah. That 61st person, oh my God, why aren't, why aren't you doing co-culture? I read a paper and do co-culture. Right. Well, it might cost you $100,000 to do an IVF cycle. So now all of a sudden you have to balance. Is that much money? No, no, no. I'm just, Uh, no, it's not that uh, much money. uh, If you are using that as an, as an exaggeration, but let's say it's another $5,000 or another $10,000 or another 20,000. Maybe that's the range because now you have to have right FDA approved cultures. Mm -hmm. You have to have FDA approved media and plating and, you know, they have to be disease-free cows. I mean, these are from cows and pigs, these cells. Some people oh, use, wow. yeah. Because you can't mean, get it, you can't, yeah. Some people try to harvest the cells from the human. Then you have to have hours and hours of, of embryology time and, and technician time. So unless you can go from 15% to 50%, right? it's really hard to spend a lot of time and energy. Now, again, I'm, I will tell you straight up, I don't follow the literature on co-culture because I would say 98% of the IVF centers don't use it. Got not it. because it's bad mm-hmm. or not because it shouldn't or couldn't help, but really because you have to weigh in any industry cost-benefit analysis. And, and, and again, you only see those people doing papers or very few clinics doing it uh, who are doing it um, is because they're trying to specialize in that area. Right. Got it. Um, so it, it sounds like it's not worth all of the energy and expense compared to the, like you said, you didn't know, you don't know details. I don't know it. the answer to that, but yeah. if a person wants it, there may be places that do it routinely. Right. I would go to a place that does it routinely because I don't think it's a trivial thing. I think it's, um, I, I, yeah, I don't think it's a trivial thing. And then, um, my other question is, oh, somebody had spoken about, um, I think that this is a very expensive scope. It's like a, it's, it's an endoscope where you don't have to move the, you don't, uh, the embryo scope, sorry, embryo scope. Yes, um, I know. So you don't have to move it and disturb the embryo as it's growing? Right. So no, well, okay. That's not the reason, <laughs> that's not the reason they invented it. Okay. Um, that th- there is a belief Again, they have yet to prove it. And it's a quarter of a million dollars per machine. Mm-hmm. I mean, think about that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> but it's machine. interesting. <laughs> no, but what it is, is it, it takes a movie of the developing embryo as it cleaves and then becomes a morula, then becomes a blastocyst. And many decades we've believed, and still, it's not great data, but it's good data that says the morphology or shape or the developmental um, um, uh, pathway that an embryo takes can predict outcomes. So the goal was to create a embryo scope that was one brand, there's many other brands, Mm -hmm. where you can watch it and then they actually build computer algorithms to measure things and they were able to say, okay, this one seems to be growing evenly better than the other one. Let's use that one. Mm-hmm. And for years and years, and now probably a decade, they've been trying to prove that it does a hill of beans better than simply <laughs> what we normally do. Right. And, and it hasn't come to fruition. Got it. it yeah. The, the companies who make them insist they do. Of course. <laughs> there, there are people who invested in them insist they do. Right. I don't think the American Society for Reproductive Medicine considers it a standard of care. So Mm -hmm. 
I would love to have them because I'm a, I'm a data guy. Mm-hmm. I love looking at that stuff. I mean, I think it's cool. Yeah. Uh, to watch. And I would, and I, I know that at some point we'll have a better understanding of how the shape of the developing blastomeres inside the uh, cleavage cell embryo or the, or the inner, inner cell mass in a blastocyst designs itself. That has to mean something, mm-hmm. you know, but again, does it significantly change from, from a reasonably standard good laboratory outcomes? Even I think this very past uh, ASRM, I don't think they had one paper saying it uh, was better than they just, I just haven't proved it yet. Uh, mm-hmm. And now if it's free, use it. I mean, there's no downside. Yeah. And yeah. if you're not, genetic testing, I mean, what the heck, it'll help you maybe sort out which embryos to put in first, but the problem is it's just not, if you look at, again, the pregnancy rates per egg retrieval, and this is, I, I'm going to start really hammering this to, to, to people, mm-hmm. ask the question that pregnancy rates per embryo per egg retrieval, mm-hmm. don't be duped into the pregnancy rates per transfer. Mm-hmm. That and 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 even SART is not very good at that, you know, or CDC. They're they're not that good at that. They're trying to do that because they're doing it per per retrieval, but then they break out the data by transfer, and everybody looks at that. Right. I mean, if your practice has a thirty percent pregnancy rate per retrieval and a seventy percent pregnancy rate per transfer, which one are you going to market? Right. You just you're just going to market it that way. Yeah. Um, it's interesting to, to look at it that way. I mean, my mind is not trained in the way that yours is, but it is interesting how just one, it's just looking at a different, uh, lens changes the whole, the whole, um, data. Yeah. yeah. And, <laughs> yeah. And, and that's why we're duped. That's yeah. why we're duped in the elections. We're duped in, in marketing. We're duped mm-hmm. in, you know, extra, extra, extra new tide. Well, mm-hmm. what's new? The packaging. Well, that doesn't mean the tide is better. It just means it's a nice package. But right? the thing is, you can see it that way. I think you're just, some people just have that mind for it. Yeah. And that's why yeah. so many people could be duped because they just don't, they're, they're not trained that way. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of something it, to, you it, know, to think it's about. Not a good, it's not a good thing for, you know, to keep good relationships with people. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> you, you see everything. <laughs> <laughs> it becomes problematic when Diane and I talk about that, uh, research. <laughs> right. <laughs> nothing, nothing passes you. <laughs> um, so my question is, since you are such a studies guy and like such a factual guy, what advances are exciting to you? Are there new um, add-ons? There, are there new studies? Well, guess what's coming down the road? Um, really? This did a lot. Bloodless IVF. What is it? Bloodless IVF. What is that? <laughs> we, we no longer have to do blood work on our patients. No more sticking for estrogen. Really? And take home ultrasounds. You How? take home. They have Wi-Fi probes that you can you rent to your patients for a month. Mm-hmm. And they can monitor themselves. And they don't have to come in for monitoring. They don't have to come in for blood work. Oh, they my just God. For... And think about that. That means every person in the United States, no matter where you live, can now do IVF. And you may only have to be out of your home for two days and not have to travel to big cities. And that means you don't have to worry about getting your OB to do the monitoring or mm-hmm. hoping that the, the, the monitoring results get to the clinic in time or worried about your estrogen levels in the 10 or 15 different ways. So that to me, I just did a live on that last week at Facebook, CNY Fertility, and we're not there yet. We're, 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 we're beginning the process. I'm looking at the papers. Mm-hmm. Cochrane did a study, you know, looking at uh, uh, not using, uh, so you're just using follicle growth, machine learning, trajectories, and predictability of that trajectory for outcomes. So that's one thing I find really exciting. That to me- So is how really- is it bloodless? How, how you do don't you draw blood? So how do you measure it? You don't have to measure the, the, the blood. You only have to measure the follicle size. Oh, it's crazy. That's so different. 
And, and, and that should, in addition, think about, I spend about, uh, well, on staffing, clinic time. Mm-hmm. Now you, you could do I, IVF center, I could do IVF in a, in a moving van. Wow, you know, that's crazy. Oh, so that's come definitely exciting. House, come to your house, take the eggs out, and then we'll, we'll drive back next week and put them back in. What? <laughs> <That's crazy. laughs> All right, my mind's blown already. That's what well, you said. What are, what are exciting? That's why. Yeah, that's mind. definitely exciting. Now, here's my question: Is is there because you mentioned a Wi-Fi or monitor monitoring? Is there more radiation that way? No, 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 no. You always okay. get no, no, no. Wi-Fi is how the information goes from the probe, or it can be uh-huh. attached. It goes to your iPhone. It's just like so, your. So the probe is the same thing as an ultrasound. Yes. Except it's completely enclosed. It's it looks exactly like the bed, but there's no wires, mm-hmm. and, you, and and you just you just basically place it in your vagina. Oh teach my it god! It. Wow! And, you know, <laughs> and so no work no no work time lost, no traveling, no worry about COVID, no worry about exposures, mm-hmm. no worry about you know having to be stuck and missing the stick and getting stuck again. Oh my you know, god! So wow. The other thing is a embryology free embryology lab no right. embryo get rid of them get a machine that can do it uh, ICSI we've got they're coming down as five patents we already have the embryoscope which is the culture system mm-hmm. we've got an automated vitrification which means it can freeze them automatically again with very little uh, operator involvement so now you're looking at a level of automation in a very proven field see that's the Mm -hmm. only way you could do this is if you've got 30 years of no changes and i I hate to say that but in 30 years we've really not changed very much what we do essentially Mm -hmm. but then you automate it like building a car used to be each car was built by hand and then ford he came up with the assembly line he said well Mm -hmm. why don't we do parts and so and then uh, Japan said, why are we using humans? Why don't we use robots to build the, the cars? Then all of a sudden, you got cars now that go 100,000 miles, don't even need to be tuned up. Mm-hmm. And they don't break wow. down. Amazing. So, so they, now is this going to, because I know it's probably going to cost a lot of money starting, but over time, is that going to decrease the IVF well, okay. price? Hey. Um, um, this is, uh, want to say hi to Dr. Hi. Kredenda? She just mm-hmm. comes live? No, it's not live. This is Michelle Orbitz. Hi, Michelle. <laughs> so, Hi. I don't know. How are you? Good. Good. How are you? <laughs> we're talking about what's new in, in the field of IVF and what's the future look like. And we mm-hmm. were just going over vitrification and everything else. Cool. Anyway. I'm in and out. <laughs> okay. See you later. <laughs> you can leave that in. You can leave yeah. that in. Okay, yeah. cool. Everybody needs to know who Dr. Fernando is. Yeah. Uh, so it doesn't cost, see, that's the key. The real cost is human labor. Right. That's the real cost and laboratory build, building a laboratory. Now, you'll still need to have um, clinically trained people to interpret the data as it comes in, mm-hmm. right? And so that's going to be people doing that. But honestly, they're only going to check much by the way. Right now, PGTA, remember uh, pre-implantation mm-hmm. genetic testing? That was done by geneticists. Mm-hmm. In other words, that was absolutely, and that's these guys. Yeah. Now, it's completely done by machine learning. Wow. Geneticists are not involved anymore. If you look at Cooper Genomics, uh, uh, PGT2 or something, it's completely done by artificial intelligence. Wow. Now, they're not destroying the price, nor mm-hmm. did it, you know, all they did was it was um, uh, data crunching. So like, for example, I work for CNY Fertility. You know, we do 10,000 cycles a year. Think about how quickly we can use and learn a bloodless idea for a new piece of equipment. Well, because I will have thousands, millions of data points, mm-hmm. but you get the mom and pop operations of which I was a mom and pop operation doing two or 300 a year. It's very hard for them to contribute to the science. So the volume of data that's out there, we just need to collect it and use it. So that's the second area. Mm-hmm. Um, the third area, I think, is the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. Mm-hmm. You, you guys are now, I hope, and I keep insisting, moving beyond IVF. 
-hmm. endometriosis, fibroids, mm -hmm. uh, managing PCOS, uh, managing pelvic pain, managing uh, recurrent pregnancy losses. Mm -hmm. It's not just pregnancy, it's fecundity. How do we get to a baby? Right. So we've got a lot of smart people asking a lot of smart questions. And I think you'll find with CNY fertility, 100% of my patients are recommended strongly to do traditional Chinese medicine in mm -hmm. the form of acupuncture. Mm -hmm. And I, 100% of them, push them towards the American Board of Oriental Reproductive Medicine. Mm -hmm. But it's now up to the American Board of Reproductive Medicine to push themselves into new areas and do some basic research. Mm -hmm. um, well, oh, Christ, genetic engineering. I mean, mm -hmm. CRISPR technology. Uh, well, that's scary good. Um, because that means that we're going to be able to fix genetic errors in embryos. It's been done already once or twice. So like BRCA gene or is yes. that what I mean? Yeah. So yeah. you're able to fix it. Yes. You're able to do wow. genetic. That's what CRISPR does. That's uh, interesting. The, news. the other thing, and this is really happening, um, stem cell derived sperm and stem cell derived egg. Mm -hmm. Get a swab from a 50-year-old woman, and, and we grow new eggs. What? Get a swab from a 50-year-old oh man. Oh, my God. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Officially, my mind is blown. <laughs> oh, it's, it's, it's uh, fascinating. It's fascinating. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, to say the least. And, yeah. So those are some <laughs> of the areas I think, you know, we're looking maybe 10 years, 20 years. I don't know. But um, I think more quickly, bloodless IVF is going to come pretty quickly. Mm -hmm. I think... Um, the automation of the embryology lab has to be done. Mm -hmm. The uh, modularization of, of satellites. If we don't have to have big buildings to do ultrasounds and blood work, because that's what the building is for, because mm -hmm. we, we only use one room to do retrievals and transfers, mm -hmm. but we have 50 rooms to do ultrasounds and blood work. Mm -hmm. So if we don't right. have to have 50 rooms, then you can literally do it in a truck. Yeah. Like, you know, like the MRIs, they drive up the MRI trucks drive up to hospitals and do it. The, the MRI is outside in a truck. Mm -hmm. Amazing. How, it's crazy. Yeah. yeah. And, and many people have um, in, in rural America, they have whole clinics that drive to mm -hmm. people out there because they don't have transportation. There is no way in my mind that we can't create mo mobile IVF mm -hmm. retrieval and transfer. It's just, yeah. it doesn't, yeah, it, it's just it's just so doable. Yeah. yeah, and it would definitely be helpful in these times for sure. Um, yeah. One question, because um, I have to get off soon, but I have a question, um, another question that seems to be something that was um, like had a different thought or um, I guess there's like different schools of thought where it used to be thought that women after transfers should just be on bed rest. Okay. And then now people are saying that it's better to do activity. So I wanted to know your data. Yeah, data. your data. data. Tell me. The data, the data has shown <laughs> there is no benefit for bed rest. Mm -hmm. But I still recommend it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Why? Why? Because I'm an old man and I know my patients have been through a lot of stress and they just need a goddamn break. Okay. Uh, that's why. But honestly, they actually, the one, not a big study, one study uh, demonstrated a reduction in pregnancy rates if you uh, stayed still versus immediate, immediate activity. Mm -hmm. I think it's a small study. But the, mm -hmm. the good news, when I first started, you had 14 days of bed rest, strict. Mm -hmm. Then we did five days of strict bed rest. Then it was two days of modified bed rest. Mm -hmm. And now... I do think seriously, the patient needs to get, and you know this better than I, to get into the right headspace after going through 11 days of STEM and medicines and shots and, mm -hmm. and being probed and pushed, let them go home, let mm -hmm. their husbands cook them dinner or their partners mm -hmm. cook them dinner. Sit down, think about pregnancy, think about the future, think about being pregnant, rest mm -hmm. that day, now we'll go back to work rest now that so you don't have to rest, so rest doesn't mean stay in bed necessarily it's bed. more of a mental kind of like take off take yeah. a day off take a couple of days yeah. off it's it's a yes exactly it's a mental health day mm -hmm. and so i don't worry i used to say don't go up and downstairs and i used to say all these things now just 
you know, chill out for a couple of days. And I like mm-hmm. your feet to be elevated. Why? Because it pulls the blood in the pelvis. Mm-hmm. And we know that implantation is going to take place in the next 48 hours. Give yourself a break. Well, you know, I've even it, heard of a study of um, laughter therapy after transfer. I don't know if you've yes. heard about this. I did, of course. It's a, out of Israel. It was mm-hmm. a study done in Israel using clown therapy. Mm-hmm. It's one study. It's yeah, not, I know. It's That's what I figured you were going to say. I'm getting to know you now. <laughs> <laughs> study. But I make everybody laugh, so yeah. I think I. Uh, that's why my pregnancy rates are so great. <laughs> yeah, I believe in laughter. I think laughter is really good. I mean, you feel good doing it. I mean, that should be a sign, right? <laughs> oh, it's endorphins. It's endorphins. Yeah. It's goodness. It's the yeah. juice of life. Uh, For sure. Laughter is, you know, it's the juice of life. It keeps you, keeps you moist. <laughs> that's right. Bada bing. <laughs> Awesome. Well, this was great. I feel like I got the full amount of questions and we didn't have to cut short, which I'm so happy about. Um, Thank you so much for all of your great information. Okay. My pleasure. You guys, everybody out there, healthy body is a fertile body. You know, that's the key. And and I think with acupuncture, you have a, you have a real partner in, in, in helping you achieve that healthy state to be fertile. So thanks, Michelle. I really appreciate it. Thank Anytime, you. if you guys want to talk, happy to talk. <laughs> Thank you so much. Take care. <laughs> Bye-bye.